probably not the first or last time in my life I will say God bless E40. <laughs> um, do we have slides? Coming. All right, I'm just going to start rolling through, and when the slides come on, we'll like see the visuals. How about that? <laughs> So last year, I ha was in Guatemala right around this time, right? And my uncle and I, my Tio Victor, we were having a conversation about our pretty ridiculous U.S. presidential election. And he knew things that, he knew things about that election that like, you just don't know about happens in Guatemala, right? Like he knew so many details. Like he was talking to me about how Melania had copied Michelle's speech, right? <laughs> and I was like, Theo, how do you know all this stuff? And he said, Mija, because everything that happens to you over there impacts us over here. And I thought, of course, like my Guatemalan uncle was going to understand the impact of power that he had no control in shaping or forming. America has been doing that to Guatemala for quite some time. And it's a part of why I know that it's happening to us again today. We're witnessing a new world being built in the cloud. And it's determining how we interact with money, information, and each other. It is saying, with all of its choices, who and what matters. And the purpose of that technology is often for frictionless, seamless experiences, right? But what if, what happens when the future of the world is being built without everyone at the table? Last year, I saw a research paper about what would happen if AI took over restaurant rankings online. And it said that there would be an immediate impact in the downgrading to Mexican restaurants. Why? Because when the machine learns from the internet, Mexican is always tied to a legal and gang member online. And I think about like the dream of a mom and pop restaurant and the work that it takes to put that up. And what happens to a family when they've done all of that work and they are impacted by something that had nothing to do with them? And I'm sure many of us remember the Google Photo fiasco from a few years ago, where Google Photos artificial intelligence was identifying black folks as gorillas. And since that's happened, the thing that I can't shake in my guts is the, the 24, 48 hour period in which this mistake was live. What happens if a young black girl is scrolling through her mom's iPhone? How does she walk through the rest of her world believing she sees herself or the world sees her? All right, we got slides, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, there is the disproportionate impact of facial recognition software on immigration and criminal, ju and criminal justice. The impacts go on and on and on. We're told innovation is good for everyone, but as you can see, without everyone at the table, there can be some really toxic outcomes. My name is Carla Monteroso. I'm Latinx, first generation Guatemalan Mexican American, first generation college and career professional from a working class family. Thank you. I am deeply invested in the communities that I grew up in. I'm a daughter and I'm the tia to a beautiful one year old girl. And I am also the CEO for Code 2040. At Code 2040, our mission is to ensure the full representation and leadership of black and Latinx people in the tech sector. 
And we're told all the time that this is a pipeline issue, that the talent is not out there. But the National Science Foundation tells us that 19% of all computer science degrees go to black and Latinx people. We are also 30% of the population in the United States. Forgive the slide faux pas. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that we are still only 5% of technical employees. And while that is a steep economic impact on our communities, it impacts all of us. It's about how the future of the world is being built. Why? Because the future of tech is the future of the world, and that future must, must, must be integrated. Rarely has the most equitable and moral thing been the most profitable thing. McKinsey tells us that racially diverse companies outperform their competitors by 33%. So what's the holdup? And now that we understand how this benefits all of us, let's ask this question just a little bit differently. What happens when the future of the world is planned with everyone at the table? Often, we have spent so much time looking at the world as it is, we can't even conceive of what the world could be like. So step into the future with me, because I've seen some of it. One of our alums, Kaya Thomas, in her spare time, by the way, built an app called We Read Too, which is a repository for children's stories with protagonists of color, so that everyone, everywhere can see everybody as a hero. And that was meaningful to me when I first heard about it, but never so much as this last year when I became a Thea. And I watch my one-year-old niece walk around my brother's house with a copy of Sonia Sotomayor, A Judge Grows in Brooklyn. I was in my 20s before I ever saw a fiction or nonfiction book that had me as a protagonist. And my beautiful niece is going to walk around having never known a world any other way. And I have Kaya to thank for that. A, a last year, I believe, or no, two years ago, we held a hackathon and a group of students had created a hybrid between Pokemon Go and LinkedIn. So you could be on the street or anywhere and do networking. Right? And in a world where 80% of jobs are gotten through friends and family, how important is that, right? When access to each other's communities is so thin. It also was helpful that it would lower unconscious bias as it would be able to identify professionals of color. How many of us from communities of color have been mistaken for a job that was not ours in the workplace just because they assumed that we were working class for being there? Right? And while those jobs are powerful and important, it is important to see the full spectrum of our talents, and that app had the potential for that. Then my very favorite, the day I met Code 2040, I saw a group of young people, four of them from the University of Puerto Rico, and that they had created an app where when you spoke to it in Spanish, it came out the other end in English. It was amazing. They had built it so that their family could have an easier time while they were off the island. This was four years ago now. But imagine the impact of a FEMA in the last year that had access to that kind of tool. Or a hospital in a community that is multilingual and multiracial. That's infrastructure that saves lives. And that is what I mean by tech is determining who matters and who doesn't. When I think of my Theo Victor and him looking at all of this, I feel like he'd see those tools and he would be blown away. And then I pause and I like think about him, the human, and what an astute person he is and understanding power. And I think, Man, what could he have built with access to those tools? 
what could he still build? Black and Latinx people have been the hidden figures of innovation since America was America. And rarely have we been able to benefit off of the power that our innovations create. This is not about racial representation for racial representation's sake. We have a genuine opportunity. We can reshape the rules of the economy and the distribution of power so massively differently right now in a way we haven't been able to since the Industrial Revolution. But blink and we will miss it. Tech has the, the capability to be the vehicle for the equitable distribution of power in a 21st century America, if it chooses to, if we choose it to. But let me tell you, if anything that I've learned from the community that I am a part of, of 6,000 Black and Latinx technologists and their allies, it is this. We can train, mentor, and manage, and organize ourselves into a more just, equitable, connected, and joyful future. Thank you.